to see you. My name is Paul, if I haven't met you. Uh, it's a real privilege to preach God's Word. Uh, there are those sermons, though, where you come to prepare and you feel a hypocrite. And there's sermons you come to preach that you know are quite confronting. And that's one of those sermons tonight where, as I'm preparing, I'm thinking, I feel such a failure in doing this. And as we listen, I'm just aware that it will be quite confronting for many people. So I'm going to pray and ask the Spirit to help us. Our Father, we come before you as a loving Father who loves us with an inexplicable love. You love us when we've failed. You love us when we wander. You love us when we rebel and when we are enemies. And you call us to love others, and that's hard. And so I pray, Lord, as your word goes out tonight, that you would teach us, encourage us, challenge us, correct us, spur us on, and empower us to live as those children that you call us to be. We ask that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, we all long to be loved. Everyone in this room tonight longs for a group of people who you know will always be there for you and always love you. Everybody in this room longs for a community that will stick with you through thick and thin, will be walking alongside you through the highs and lows of life, that will stand by you and will just love you, lavish you with love. Whatever your circumstance, your background, your age, or your stage, all of us long for that group of people in life who will just love us. And I want to suggest that, that community should be and can be and must be the church. The church is defined as a group of people who will love each other with a, a selfless, sacrificial, indiscriminate, always being there kind of love. And I know that we fail, but that's the bar that Jesus sets. I know it's not natural to love like that, and that's why the Bible says you cannot love like this until you yourself have experienced the lavish love of God. You can't possibly love like this unless the Spirit of God is in you. But here's the but. But if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, if you claim to love Jesus, then God calls us to love each other. Remember the famous words of Jesus from John 13? They're on the screen. He says, love one another. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He's just saying love changes everything. Love will change everything. It's not an optional extra. He commands us to love. We expect his love. He says, you must love one another. And then he sets the, the example. He sets the model. It's a high bar. As I have loved you, as Jesus loved us with that selfless, sacrificial, extravagant, lavish love. That's the model. So, so church, we have, this, we have this privilege. We have this joy. We have this honor of, of loving each other. That is part of our, of our true and proper worship. Remember that phrase from Romans 12, verse 1? This is your true and proper worship. As you offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God, you're called to love each other. And as you love each other as church, we're actually worshiping God. And as we love each other as church, we're actually witnessing to the watching world. And Jesus says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another... Uh, the famous evangelist D.R. Moody says this, the world is not interested in theology, but it does understand and notice love. And he's right. Uh, the watching world, the people who are not sitting in church tonight, they are not sitting at home wrestling with doctrines of election or sanctification or justification. They're not thinking about theology. They're not listening to an amazing band playing worship music. They don't notice that. They know nothing about our connect groups or our programs or activities. But they do notice love. They do notice when the church loves well. And they do notice when 
people who are going through really hard times in life are surrounded by other people who lavish them with love, who provide meals, who visit the hospital, who sit and cry with them. They, they spot that. And they do notice when we as a church speak kindly to each other and about each other, and even when we've been hurt, we don't retaliate. They notice that. The watching world notices when we love each other. And that's what I want this church to be like, a loving community. The church is not supposed to be full of of beautiful people who have life perfectly all together. Church is just full of broken people with messy lives who've experienced the mercy of God and show that in the way that we love each other. So love one another. That's our theme for tonight, Romans 12, verses 9 to 21, love each other. We're in what I call the so what section of Romans. So it's verses 1 and 2, just to recap, verses 1 and 2 of this chapter are all about the way that you relate to God. In view of God's mercy, worship him. But in view of God's mercy, in view of all the ways that God has been merciful to you, chapters 1 to 11... In view of the fact that God has chosen you and sanctified you and justified you, he's lavished you with love, he's set you free from your sin, and so there's no condemnation. In view of all of that, make sure that you worship God. Uh, Verses 3 to 8 are all about the way you relate to yourself, the way you think about yourself. Uh, In view of God's mercy, think of yourself rightly. Don't be proud, don't be arrogant, just be humble. And recognize you're part of a body where you belong to each other. So so relate rightly to God. Relate rightly to yourself. Verses 9 to 21 are all about the way you relate to other people. And the repeated word is love, 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 love. I reckon that word love is the most overused word in our world. I can stand here tonight and I can say, I love my wife. I love my boys. I love my friends, I love my church. And in the next breath I can say, I love Indian takeaway. I love coffee. As those things are comparable, the same kind of love. What is love? And I hope you know that love is not just physical attraction. It's not just an emotional feeling. Love is actually a verb. It's a doing word. And there are four words for love in the Bible. There's the eros love, which is the the sexual, physical love. Uh, There's the the Philadelphia love, which is the the brotherly love, brother to sister love. There's a storgai love, which is a a parental love, like a parent loves a child. And then there's agape love. And agape love is the way that God loves us with this sacrificial, selfless, extravagant, lavish, indiscriminate, undeserved love. Agape love. And in the whole of Romans so far, God has used agape as the way that God loves us. Agape, agape, agape love, the way that God loves us. Until you get to Romans 12, verse 9. He's exactly the same word there in verse 9. Love one another, that same kind of selfless, sacrificial, God-like love. As St. Augustine said, what does love look like? Love has, has the hands to help others has the feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has eyes to see misery and want. It has ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of people. That is what love looks like. And and these 13 verses are extraordinary verses. You have 30, 30 separate exhortations or commands to love. It's a bit like a machine gun going off, bang, 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 bang. And there are two dangers when you read a list like this. The first danger is it is also overwhelming. It just washes over you and you walk away having learned nothing. And I'm praying you just take one thing, just one way you could love differently tonight. And the second danger is that you read this list and the bar is so high that you feel guilty and a failure. That's okay. We, we can't actually do it. We need the Spirit of God to help us do it. Now, normally when I preach, uh, we work through the text and we look at the meanings of words and the context, but you know what? These words are not hard to understand. They're just really hard to do. And so tonight I want to get practical and think about how we're going to do this, what it would look like in our church. So I've got four ways for you to love. 
Here's the first one. A sincere love. A sincere love. Verse 9. Love must be sincere. It must be genuine. It must not be fake. It mustn't be two-faced. It's not that, that phony, lower nor sure, superficial niceness where you pretend to listen, but you're really not. Uh, the word for sincere there is, is literally not hypocritical. Uh, and it comes from the word of acting. So in Bible times, it'd have a stage but there'd be no sets, there'd be no props, there'd be no scenery. The actor would walk on stage with a mask on a stick. A happy mask, or a sad mask, or an angry mask. And Paul is saying here, don't put on masks in church when it comes to love. Don't walk into church and pretend to be somebody. Stop acting. Don't walk into church and go, today I'm going to pretend to be your caring friend, Christian. And so tell me all your problems, and I walk out of church, I'm going to gossip and slander about you. That's not sincere, that's fake. Uh, Today, I'm going to be your best friend. So talk to me, and I'm not going to listen to a word you say, because I'm I'm miles away, and I'm just not listening at all. That's just fake. It's phony. And Paul looks at the church and says, get rid of that. Church is not a theatre where you put on a mask and pretend. Church is about real people doing real life. You can spot fake love, you can spot phony love. It is showy, it's insincere, and it leaves you feeling yucky. Do you remember Judas Iscariot who, who approached our Saviour Jesus Christ and he kissed him? That's fake love. He kissed him and then walked away and betrayed him. So don't love from a script, but love from the heart. Be sincere, be genuine, be honest, be real. Quit the phoniness. He unpacks that in verse 9. Literally, it says, love must be sincere, literally hating what is evil and clinging to what is good. So the way that we're going to love sincerely or genuinely is to hate what is evil. And that sounds strong because it is strong. The word there is abhor, you're horrified. You don't tolerate evil. You don't normalize evil. You don't indulge in evil. So so when we see error in God's church, when we see God's people doing the wrong thing and hurting others and hurting God, we don't tolerate that. The loving thing to do is not to sit in silence. The loving thing to do is to confront sin. The loving thing to do is to get alongside somebody and point out evil. In, In a church, you must hate evil. Detest immorality. Lament injustice. In this church, there will be zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for any kind of abuse against kids, against adults. No violence, no bullying. That has no place in God's church. It's not loving. And then we cling on to what is good. We stick with, we glue ourselves to whatever is good and wholesome and upright and beautiful. That's sincere love. So church, can can I implore you to be genuine and not fake? Number two, a devoted love. A devoted love. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Be committed, be reliable, be consistent, be always there for each other, especially in times of need. Uh, the, The word devoted is best encapsulated by a dog and its owner. You ever seen a dog and its owner? The the dog is, say, 14 years old, has been a family pet since he's a puppy. And the owner comes home and the dog is sitting at the door, always there waiting. Best friend, best companion, always hanging out. That's the idea behind that word devoted. We we, we are there for each other. We need each other. Uh, Paul actually shifts the word love in verse 10 from agape to to Philadelphia, to, to brotherly love. He says, your family and families stick together through thick and thin. Even when you don't see each other for a while, you're still family. And I have seen that in our church. We, we do this pretty well. We, we, ha- we look out for each other. We're there for each other. We are reliable. We're kind. A church should be a safe place where you can talk about your fears, your anxieties, your concerns without feeling any judgment. And Paul highlights two ways to do this. Two ways to be devoted. The first word is is generosity. See that verse 13? 
Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And again, you don't need a PhD in Greek to understand that, do you? It's just hard to do. He says, meet people's needs, material and emotional. Let me, let me remind you that everything you own, everything you have, has been given by God, entrusted to you by God, and to be used to bless other people. Everything. And, and I, know that, I know that we can't help everyone, but everyone here can help someone. There is somebody in your life right now who's in need. Someone in church, someone in your, your, your street, someone in your office, somebody with a need that you could meet. And we're called to be generous. The early church, Acts chapter 2, was known for its generosity. It says there was nobody in need because they all sold their possessions and shared. Now we live in a, an extraordinarily prosperous part of the world. We have so much. But there are people in massive needs, even in this church. You hear of somebody who needs a car, lend them your car. Someone needs a holiday, if you've got a holiday home, lend them your holiday home. Or contribute to them going away somewhere. Someone's going to go through a really hard time in life, just turn up with a meal. Don't wait for the staff team to put a roster together. Just turn up. There's a couple who, who left uh, this church about 10 years ago now. They moved over to London. They visited a church once in London. After that one visit in that first week, that church provided some furniture for them, a stroller for their child, talked to the bank to show how banking worked, and bought, bought them an Oyster card, which is like, like our Opal cards. And you won't be surprised to learn that that couple joined that church because it experienced love, real love. And can I have a pastoral moment? I, I do think we could improve on this church. I think we are good at rostered generosity. We're not so good at spontaneous generosity. We're called to be spontaneous. And we're called to show that in hospitality, verse 13. Practice hospitality. He doesn't say talk about it or preach a sermon on hospitality. He says do it. Pursue it. Remember, hospitality is loving the stranger. It's not inviting your best friends around for a nice meal with a nice glass of wine, that's called entertaining. Hospitality is when you invite people into your heart and into your home who are unlike you, who are lonely, who are sad, who are on the outer, on the fringe, expecting nothing in return, but you just want to get to know them and to bless them. That's hospitality. Now, now people say that uh, Church by the Bridge and uh, St. Augustine's is a very welcoming church. I think we were very welcoming. But again, I think we could step up a notch here when it comes to hospitality. So a devoted love is about generosity. And it's about empathy. I love verse 15. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice. And mourn with those who mourn. A devoted love will mean that we enter into the different seasons of people's lives. And we walk alongside them in the mess. We rejoice when they rejoice, but when they are sad and when they are sorrow, when they are hurting, we feel their pain. And those words rejoice and those words mourn, they're actually emotional words. Church, don't be awkward with your emotions. It's okay, no more than okay, it's good and right and proper to be emotional. Don't stand aloof, but get alongside. One of the deep joys of being church is you get to walk alongside people in all these different seasons of life. Now, yesterday at a wedding, this Friday I've got a funeral. I'm mourning with those who are mourning. I'm rejoicing with those who are rejoicing. Uh, for those who know Corey and Sarah, today would have been little Jed's fourth birth birthday. He died just um, almost three years ago. And to walk alongside them for the last three years in their pain, absolute pain, Absolute joy to do that. And then to, to rejoice when Elise was born just over a year ago. Absolute joy to do that as well. The highs and lows of life. You do life together. Now, I'm sure there's people in your life who are longing for, for you to get alongside them and to feel their pain. I often say the Lord does not take us out of trials and troubles. He takes us through them. But in our trials and in our troubles... He puts people, family, church family in with us 
We must never do that alone. We have the privilege of sharing in pain. And again, I think we are pretty good at this. Rachel and I experienced this in abundance when our three boys were born severely prematurely. We just loved and loved and loved. It is strange. I reckon that many of us find it easier to weep with those who are weeping than to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. It's kind of perverse. To, to, to walk alongside someone in the dark times of life, to sit with them, to cry with them, to pray with them, we can do that. But when God is showing his goodness and blessing to people in the good times of life, especially if you're not in a good spot, something within you kicks in and it's almost like, well, why them, God, and not me? And it's almost like you get a bit envious or a bit jealous or a bit competitive. It should not be that way. No matter what season you're in, rejoice with those who are rejoicing. That's a devoted love. It's empathy and it's generosity. It's knowing needs, seeing needs, and meeting needs. That's the word of love. Number three, a harmonious love. Verse 16, he says, live in harmony with one another. Live in agreement. Be friends with each other. Get on with each other. Listen to each other and do life well together. Now, if you're musical, you understand this word harmony, don't you? A harmony is when you've got different instruments playing different notes and different tunes, but it just sounds beautiful together because the violins are listening to the French horns and the clarinets are listening to what the timps are doing. Uh, An orchestra playing in harmony is a beautiful noise, but an orchestra where one instrument is so doggedly determined to do their own thing and to play their own tune, it sounds disgusting. And sadly, that can be church. Sadly, sometimes we have these people who insist on walking to their own tune, thinking that they are the most important person in church. That's ugly. Paul gives us two words to live in harmony, honor and humility. If we're going to live in harmony, we need to honor one another, verse 10. Honor one another above yourself. Honoring people is about recognizing their worth. It's not about their talent. It's about just seeing how precious they are in God's sight. Now, every brother or sister here tonight is a child of God, made in the image of God, loved by God, forgiven by God, and cherished by God. So you value them. You you treat them like they matter. To honor people means that you speak positively about them. You You build them up. You don't tear them down. You you make time to listen to them. You care about their struggles and their worries and their pains and their joys more than your own. To honor them means that you might might celebrate their birthdays. You might spot them doing something and write them a little card. I I love it in church when you get people up the front just to celebrate them and honor them. Uh, my, my goal in life, and I, I do fail, my goal in life is when I'm thinking about an individual, uh, 10 words of praise before one word of criticism, 10 to 1 ratio. <laughs> Honor people and be humble. Verse 16, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. If we're going to live in harmony, let's get rid of our pride. You know, there's conversations after church where someone's talking to you and they're talking about all the restaurants they've eaten at, the holidays they've been on, the clothing labels that they've bought that week. You're thinking, why are you telling me this? It's all about you. That's not, that's not conducive for harmony. Now be humble. Recognize that there's no one inferior and no one superior in this church. We're all one in Christ. Now, to be honest, I don't care whether you live in the the biggest house in Mossman with the flashiest car, with a pool in the backyard, go on the flashiest holidays and have the biggest reputation, the best job. In my eyes, you are no different from Julie on that video who lives in Greenway, who loves Jesus because we're all one in Christ. And when you grasp that, it's really helpful to see yourself right. You just humble yourself. So honoring and humility will help us live in this harmonious love. It's it's like being part of a choir. If you want to be part of a choir, stop wanting to be a soloist. In in a choir, there are no soloists. We just listen to each other and make a beautiful noise together. So that is love. 
It's sincere, it's devoted, it is harmonious. And this is where it gets really difficult with point number four. Loving people who love you is easy. But loving people who hate you is really hard. So number four, a courageous love. A courageous love. Uh, Rick Warren says this, God teaches us to love by putting some unlovely people around us. It takes no character to love people who are lovely and loving to you. It takes great character to love people who are unlovely and unloving to you. So let me ask you, how do you respond to people who have hurt you, people who have wronged you, people who have slandered you and offended you? How do you respond to people who just plainly hate you? This is where it gets uncomfortable and confronting, but this is love. This is love. Let's start with the negatives. Verse 14, uh, do not curse. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 19, do not take revenge. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil. He's saying don't retaliate, don't seek revenge, don't look for the opportunity to bad mad that person, don't slander them, don't hold on to grudges, and don't hurt them in any way. Now, believe me, I know that's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly hard. Because when someone has wronged me or hurt me or slandered me, everything within me, my fleshly nature, it just wants to retaliate. And a little part of me wants to see them really hurt. And that is wrong. That's not Christ-like. That's not the way of Christ. That's the way of the world. That's not love. No, this is love. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Ask God to bless them. Pray for them. Bless them with your words. Bless them with your act of kindness. Show them practical love, even though they persecuted you. What did Jesus say about your enemies? Turn the other cheek. Go the second mile. Love your enemies, pray for your enemies, forgive your enemies. And he modeled that on the cross, didn't he? On the cross when he was insulted, he prayed, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. This is Christ-like love. Those people who have wounded you and hurted you and offended you and slandered you, you bless them. You love them. You don't repay. Verse 17, you do not repay evil for evil. You don't get back at them. No, you're careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. You make sure that you don't stoop to their level. One thing I've learned over the years, when I've been wronged, when people have slandered me or said untruths about me, there are a couple of things I've learned. Number one, don't look for every opportunity to, to tell my side of the story to make myself feel better. And the second thing is this. If you can't say anything positive about them, say nothing at all. Just be silent, rather than using words to, to, to bring them down. And this is courageous love, verse 18. If it's possible, sometimes it's not, sadly. Sometimes it's not possible. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That includes your enemies. So if it's possible... Sit down and think, now, have I done everything possible? H have I asked to meet that person? Have I sat and listened to them? Have I apologized for the things I needed to apologize for? Have I asked for their forgiveness? I I've done that many times. And, and occasionally, they've thrown it back in my face. But I, I, I with a clear conscience, can say, I've done everything possible. If it's possible, pursue peace. It liberates you. Let me ask you, the person, you're, the person you're thinking about right now who have hurt you the most, do you pray for them? Do you pray for them? And do you look up at, looking for opportunities to pursue peace? I love this quote, you will never really love until you really love someone who really hates you. <laughs> you will never really love until you really love someone who really hates you. And I know this is so hard. <laughs> And you can only love like this when you get your theology right. Verse 19, do not take revenge, 
my dear friends, my beloved one. I love the fact he puts that sentence in. My beloved one, this is good for you. Believe me, don't take revenge. I know you think that vengeance can be fun and it will be entertaining. I know it will, it will make you feel better, but it won't. Revenge only hurts you. And no, verse 19, leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. That is very comforting, isn't it? When you trust that God will do the right thing, when you trust that punishment is God's domain and not yours, that is liberating. And one thing I've learned is that God is always better at vengeance than I ever am. He's always better than I am. Because God knows all the motives, all the details. He's a perfect judge who will judge with perfect justice. Sometimes in this world, but if not in this world, on that final day of judgment. So to hand it over to God. Hand it over to him. I, I can think of two recent situations where I, I, I've, I've been treated poorly and I, I feel like I've faced injustice. And to be honest, it was started to eat me up until I handed it over to God. Entrusted it to God and said, God, you deal with this. And it's been totally liberating. It's got rid of all my bitterness. It's like it's just oozed out of me. I just feel free. It's not just handing it over to God. It's actually handing out good. He goes one step further in verse 20. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Be kind. Treat him as a friend, not an enemy. Speak words of kindness to him and about them. And in doing so, verse 20, you will heap burning coals on his head. That, that's not intended to harm, but intended to heal. If you're kind and treat them as a friend, then perhaps, just perhaps, you'll bring them to, to their senses and, to, and they might realize the wrong they've done. Now, the sad reality is that all of us in this room have got people who are our enemies, who have hurt us, who have wounded us. And I believe there are people here tonight who need to be set free and liberated from that. And the way to do is to love them, to bless them, to pray for them, and to hand it over to God. There's a beautiful moment on, um, on Q&A about three years ago when the whole same-sex marriage debate was happening. And the archbishop was on the panel with five other people, four other guests, I think it was. And the four other guests... They ripped the archbishop to shreds. Now, they were so rude to him. They were vicious with their words. They were patronizing. And the way he responded, he did not retaliate. When he opened his mouth, he spoke words of gentleness and kindness and peace. And it just spoke volumes to me. I remember about this time last year when that couple that Christian couple who tragically had three of their kids killed when that car mounted that pavement. Do you remember that? And this Christian couple stand, stood in front of the media and there wasn't a hint of retaliation. There wasn't a hint of revenge. And they spoke about forgiveness and love. And that was powerful. That was so, so powerful. Because in that moment, you got a glimpse of the love of Christ. Because if you think about it, you were God's enemies. You offended him. You hurt him. You rebelled against him. And yet he loved you. He lavished you with his love. There was no hint of revenge, no hint of retaliation. He just wanted to love you. And you're called to love others like that. It is hard. It is hard. It's almost impossible. It is impossible. <laughs> It is impossible without the love of God in your heart by the Holy Spirit. So please remember that we can only love like this because he first loved us. So bathe yourself in God. Soak yourself in God's love. That's what he says in verse 11. Don't be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. Love God well. Be on fire for God. Serve God. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer, make sure that you're sticking close to God and so in love with God because the more in love with God you are, the more he'll equip you and empower you to love people like that. So we all want to be loved. We all want to be loved. My prayer is that this church 
us gathered here tonight might be a reflection of God's love for us, that we might actually love each other with a sincere, devoted, harmonious, and courageous love. Let me pray. I'll give you a moment just to ask the Spirit to bring to mind the name of one person that you might love better. Our Father, we ask that your Spirit would enable us and equip us to love this person well. Father, forgive us for our fakeness or our phoniness. Forgive us, Father, for times that we're not generous or we don't walk alongside people through the the good and the bad. Lord, transform us. Give us that privilege and that joy and that honor of being your hands and feet that brings your love, not just to this church, but to the watching world. And we ask that for Jesus' sake.